Camp by uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, 65 years ago today, February the 8th. We uh, trained at Fort uh, as a battalion uh, at Fort Benning for a while when I was assigned to the 7th Field Artillery Battalion, Battery C, like Charlie. I didn't fully understand at that early stage the ramifications of what I was getting into. All I knew is that I wanted to be in the service because the war was, was heating up all over the world. <clears throat> I knew that eventually I would be in it because I was at the right age in the uh, early 20s. And uh, therefore, I, I knew that I, was going to, I wanted to get as much training as I possibly could. The 1st Infantry Division is a renowned organization that had been in World War I. They had been one of the best in World War I and were cited by both the French governments and the American governments for what they did. So there was a lot of pride in the organization. We trained uh, in Fort Benning for some time, about uh, two months before we were ordered to go to Louisiana and join with a lot of other troops, including the rest of our division, who at that time had been scattered pretty much up and down the eastern seaboard. And we were to uh, join an exercise to train as a division. We did that, and we went by convoy, and we got uh, when we got to Louisiana, we. Uh, trained as a combat team, a combat team meaning one battalion of artillery and one regiment of infantry composed a combat team. We were the 16th combat team because the 16th infantry was our infantry regiment. <clears throat> we did uh, training there as a unit uh, for approximately six weeks. After that time, we dispersed, and all the units went back to their home stations. Ours happened to be Fort Ethan Allen, Vermont, just out of uh, Burlington, Vermont. Uh, the 16th was going to Fort J, New York. That was their home base. After we got back to Fort Ethan Allen and got settled down a little bit, we were told that because of the joint training exercises that we'd have to be a part of in the future, that we were going to, the entire group was going to be transferred to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. That's just outside of the town of Air, Mass. And uh, so we moved there. It was a fairly new camp. It had just been, uh, buildings had been constructed recently. And, uh, so we uh, stayed there for probably three or four weeks when we were told that we would, uh, we would be in joint training exercises with the 16th and that they were coming up to Camp Edwards on Cape Cod and we were to join them there. We did that and uh, we trained as a unit there and we did that two or three times but returning each time to our home base. Then after the, uh, the, on the third or fourth trip to Cape Cod, we were to uh, go into amphibious training. In other words, we were going to uh, learn about invading another country and how to go about it. So out of Buzzards Bay, Cape Cod, we uh, boarded ships training ships, and we would go out to sea for eight or ten miles, and then they would put us, drop us off on landing craft, and we would turn and come back in on the landing craft and attack the beach of Cape Cod. Uh, we learned a lot about that and uh, about uh, an invading force and amphibious uh, work, and uh, we left there pretty well uh, assured that we could do it. After we got back to our base camp, maybe three weeks later, a month later, we were sent to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. 
Now we knew Indian Town Gap was a port of debarkation. From there, troops went overseas. <clears throat> and we didn't know where overseas, but we knew that we were headed overseas. We were outfitted with uh, some new equipment, and uh, so we left there by train to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, where we boarded the HMS Queen Mary. Now, the Queen Mary is a huge ship. I'd never seen anything as big as that in my life. <clears throat> it looked like a hotel on water. And uh, we kept pouring troops in and pouring troops in until I estimated that we had, uh, well, I know we had the 16th Infantry, the, uh, the three battalions of artillery, and the three regiments of infantry on board. That would be about 20-odd thousand troops. And they bunked us down on deck with uh, some had hammocks. Some just slept on the floor. Uh, we uh, all had assigned mess areas. We were fed two meals a day, or to be fed two meals a day, and so forth. I was called up to the deck, uh, to the bridge, rather. And uh, once I got there, my commander told me, he said, you are going to defend the ship as we go across. Well, I was taken aback. I said, defend it what with? And he said, well, we got 14 Orlikon guns, seven on each side. I said, what's an Orlikon gun? He said, it's a 40 millimeter machine gun, high powered, and will penetrate armor, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then on the stern, you have a six pounder, a British six pounder. I said, does that mean that the projectile weighs six pounds? He said, yep, you understand a lot already. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, I went back and looked at that six-pounder, and that thing had been left over from some war in the way distant past, and the gears were worn out, the, the uh, tube was worn out. Oh, it was terrible shape. You could shake it from six inches from side to side. But anyway, I, I knew that wasn't going to be much help. I went and looked at the Orlikon guns, and they were fairly new. They were made in Sweden. Uh, they were good. They carried a pretty big projectile, 40 millimeters, a pretty good-sized projectile. And I knew that we could penetrate some light armor, but there's no way we could penetrate any armor in a, a submarine because the, the submarine armor would be much thicker, and uh, there's just no way we could do it. Anyway... We left that night, and as we went out into the night, we, we traveled straight. <clears throat> I mean, in a straight line. When daylight came, we zigzagged every seven minutes at a 45-degree angle. I uh, questioned why we were doing that, and the British officer of the deck, officer of the bridge, rather, I keep saying the deck, but it's the bridge, he... Uh, informed me that it takes a German submarine eight minutes to get in position, load, and aim, and get a projectile on the way, and having time for it to strike its target. And in view of that, by the time they got to us, we would be either be headed in another direction or headed directly for them, which would minimize the target, and it was doubtful that they could hit us. So with that bit of uh, consolation, we were headed across the North Atlantic. Now we outfitted everybody on the ship with a life vest, but I knew, and most of the other people knew, that if we were ever sunk in the North Atlantic, you wouldn't last over five, six, eight minutes in that water at most, because it's cold, 60 degrees or more, and uh, thermography would get you, you'd be, you'd be dead, uh, just like they were on the Titanic. So I knew that was a futile type of uh, thing, but we had to do something, and that's what we did. We made it to the Firth of Clyde, which is a uh, in Scotland, near Glasgow, in five days. Uh, we uh, disembarked and were, went ashore uh, with uh, some of us going by truck convoy. That was The trucks were already there. We didn't bring any equipment with us and the uh, others by train, 
and we again didn't know where we were headed. By the way, the reason you're not told is that if the Germans had, were, had for example, if had sunk the ship or managed to get a prisoner, they could make the prisoner tell where we were going. So uh, that way, you just don't, you just aren't told. You're going to go as a group anyway. Well, we got to uh, Ro uh, got to Salisbury uh, Plain, which is a, a city in the south central part of England, and uh, it is uh, uh, near there is a cantonment that had been used uh, since the Middle Ages, I presume, because there were pegs in the wall where you were to hang your shield, the little sign says, and, and some of them. And, of course, we didn't have any shields, so we hung our rifles on those, though uh, the, that is the crew people did. And uh, that, uh, that took care of that. Within a very short while, after we were at Salisbury, uh, I was again called to the front office and told that with, along with about 150 other guys from the regiment and the battalion, that we were going for some special training, quote unquote. Again, we're not told what kind of training it was, but we were going for some special training. We left that day and uh, caught a train and went back to Scotland and to a little town named Roseneath. And Roseneath, Scotland, is a very was a very insignificant little town, but outside of it there was a training camp. We went to the training camp, and there we were told that we were going to train as commandos. Well, now, we had heard of commandos. We didn't know a lot about them. We knew they were a tough bunch, that they went in early and did a lot of damage to destroy targets, uh, preparing for invasions, things of this nature. Uh, that they, they did a lot of raiding, uh, going ashore, raiding uh, areas to, de uh, to destroy the morale of the enemy by their killing, that sort of thing. We trained there three months. And the British non-commissioned officers who were training us tried every way in the world to break our spirit, and they couldn't because they treated us tough, rough. Uh, it was the roughest thing I'd ever been through in my life. And many times I wasn't quite sure that I was going to make it, <clears throat> but I did. And our graduation exercise was three words. Gentlemen, you're finished. And that's it. They put us on a train as a group and sent us to London. Now, we knew we were in London because London was under siege by, from, by the Nazis from the air. And that wasn't exactly a place we wanted to be at that time, but so be it. That's, we had to be there. They took us to a hotel all blacked out. Everything was blacked out. And uh, once we were in the hotel... We had a meal, and a few hours later, a British officer came in, introduced himself, <clears throat> and said that we were supposed to go on the Dieppe raid on the coast of France, <clears throat> and that we were to be a part of the Dieppe raid, and, uh, but there was a glitch. And the glitch was that the Canadians had learned that the Americans were going on the raid, and they didn't like it because they were a part of the empire and we were not, they felt that they needed to be the ones to go on the raid. So we were to be sent back to Salisbury Garrison, and we were. By the way, the raid was a, a success in a sense, but the losses were high, and the Canadian unit, we learned later, that replaced us took some severe losses. We never didn't know ex what the exact casualty figures were. But anyway, from Salisbury, we were removed to a port. And I don't know what the name of the port was, but we were put on board a ship called the HMS Warwick Castle. Uh, the HMS Warwick Castle had been a British 
cruise liner before the war. Some said traveling between South America and England. And uh, on board were built uh, six large towers. And on those towers were mounted machine guns. Uh, and that was, a that was what we were to defend the ship with. I don't, I don't have any idea how many troops we had on board, but I know that we had at least three batteries of the 7th Field Artillery Battalion. And we had our guns with us. We had all of our equipment with us. So we went to, uh, out to sea, and again, I was given the day shift of commanding the guns, and another officer was given the night shift. And we were to make sure that those crews were on the ready, and of course, uh, it was sort of foolish in a way, because we couldn't have defended that thing unless somebody attacked us from a rubble, and that wasn't likely to happen. Uh, about the only thing we could do was uh, make sure that the crews were ready. But we had to be very careful and practice firing because there were other ships in the convoy and we might hit one of them. So we just decided that the best thing to do was that if we were attacked, we would fight uh, by the seat of our pants. It's about the only thing we could do. We traveled uh, west a couple of days out into the North Atlantic again, which was a very, very bad place to be, believe me. We turned south, we could tell by the sun, for about three days. The entire convoy, we could see them all. We could see occasionally on the horizon, we could see a plume of smoke and know that the submarines got a ship. They were pecking them off. But ours, we were very fortunate. We didn't have anything near us, or it certainly didn't hit us. And then when we, after about three days, we turned east. Now we knew that we were headed for the shore. We didn't know where, had no idea. And we didn't really care. We knew that we were going to go ashore. We got ready. We were preparing our troops. We were checking the equipment. We were checking people. We were making sure that everybody knew exactly what to do. Uh, we, had, uh, we had the equipment for, to drop landing nets over the side of the ship. Uh, we'd string one up inside the ship in one of the dining salons or something and practice climbing it and coming back down it with full gear on, full equipment, and that sort of thing. One uh, night, very shortly thereafter, we approached land with lights blazing. And we could tell by the, uh, by the shadow of the Rock of Gibraltar that that's where we were. We were going through the Straits of Gibraltar. There were lights on both sides. So we, this massive convoy of dark ships going through there, and we, when we got through, we turned. I thought we were going to turn to the left and go up to the belly of France, of Europe, and probably land somewhere near Marseille or something like that and go on inland from there. But we didn't. We turned to the right. And when we did, I, I was thrown off course. I didn't know where we were going then. Well, of course, we were headed for Morocco and North Africa. We landed at a place just north of Oran called Arzu. A-R-Z-U is the way I, as I remember it. <clears throat> we went ashore. We had very little resistance, but we had a little, little. We didn't know what the resistance was or where it came from, really, or who it was. Of course, to us, it was a big thing. It was the first time we had been under fire. But it turns out it was the Vichy French. And they had uh, uh, found out we were coming ashore, and they had tried to fire some of us. In the meantime, I was given a job to go up to uh, capture a castle about uh, a half a mile offshore. So I took a platoon, about 80 people, and went up there and walked right up to it. Now this was at a little before daylight, about uh, maybe maybe 4 o'clock in the morning, and walked right up to the thing. 
And there was a couple of sentries there, and we uh, recognized them as French soldiers. They didn't fire a shot. They didn't try to stop us. They didn't do anything, and we just took their rifle away from them and set them down and said, stay right here. We put one man there to be, to be sure they did. We went inside. We found the cooks in there preparing breakfast. We took them prisoner, but they wanted to finish up the cooking because it would burn, and we put some, crew, uh, some troops in there and let them do that. In fact, I tasted uh, one of the breads that they were making. It was very, very good. Then we went on up to the barracks area, and after they pointed out where it was, and when we got there, we walked into the barracks, and the all the troops were sound asleep. Uh, they had their rifles stacked in the aisles. We just simply walked troops down to the stacks of rifles, and that was it. And then we woke them up. And after we woke them up, we took their small arms, we took their grenades, uh, we took them prisoner, we let them eat their breakfast, they, they fed them the breakfast, and we ate with them, and then we took them down and turned them over to, took them to a soccer field, and there we turned them over to another group who took them, uh, kept them as prisoners. We went back to our, our mission. We fought for three days, and I say fought. Uh, it was spasmodic, it's sort of sporadic. Uh, it wasn't like a battle of World War I, which we didn't know, that's about all we knew. You know, you jump out of the trench at a whistle and rush a machine gun nest, nothing like that. It was a, pretty much a, we'd fire a few shots at them, they'd get up and move, and we'd fire, they'd fire a few at us, we'd get up and move, that sort of thing. And it, on the third day, they capitulated, they gave up. Uh, apparently they had orders from above to cease fire. Well, at that point, we established regular bivouacs, and uh, we, uh, uh, they had brought in, by that time, they were bringing in a lot of equipment, trucks and, and equipment like that. Uh, so we were in this bivouac area, and they routed us out one morning and said, we're going to go up close to the front. The front was the Atlas Mountains. Uh, the Atlas Mountains was to the mountain range that ran parallel to the coast, and the plains between the mountains and the coast of, uh, of the Mediterranean was where the fighting was going on with the British Eighth Army chasing the uh, uh, Africa Corps up the plain toward Algiers. Excuse the pause there. Uh, after I was told that our primary mission was going to be uh, to, the, to stop up the uh, passes in the mountain to keep the Africa Corps from coming through the mountain and flanking the British Eighth Army or getting into their uh, rear echelon and creating havoc. So we did. We went to a town called Gafsa El Gatar, uh, and there we set up a defensive mechanism to keep the uh, Africa Corps from coming through to flank the Eighth. And uh, there was quite a battle there. Uh, we uh, they they tried with two tank divisions, the Ninth and Eleventh Panzer Division, to come through. Our first armored division, and uh, General Patton was there. He was the commander, the overall commander. And uh, the, the infantry, third infantry division was on one side of the pass. We were on the, the first on the other. And with all the artillery that we had, the mortars, the, the troops that we had in position, things like this, we stopped them. Uh, that was our baptism of fire. And I got involved in a uh, an artillery duel uh, with uh, some 90 millimeter tank guns. And I was wounded there, but the wound was not severe, uh, severe enough for me to go to the rear. I wanted to stay there and do my job because that's what I was trained to do. Well, the Germans pulled out and went on up the uh, plane, and we knew we had to go up there too. 
up north. So we followed the range on up to a place called Oselsia Valley. We had one incident there that's interesting. Uh, General Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, the son of the president, Teddy Roosevelt, was our deputy division commander. He was a brigadier general. Uh, at one point, I had fired into a sheltered area and a large number of Italian troops decided that it was best to give up. So they raised white flags and started marching toward us. Of course, we stopped firing immediately. As they came on in, there was about a mile to travel. And they, they were in two columns. General Roosevelt got very excited. He wanted to go down and bring those troops in himself. Well, of course, immediately we had to stop him. We, we told him that General, among that group, I'm sure there are people who've still got grenades and they've still got sidearms, and it would be an excellent chance for one of them to be a martyr to kill an American general. And if you go down there with that star, even though it's on the back of your helmet, that's the way we had to wear them, on the back of your helmet, you, uh, you're going to be killed. And we finally convinced him that that may be the prudent thing to do is to wait until we had an opportunity with the infantry to shake them all down. And then after that, he could do what he wanted to with them. Anyway, that uh, solved the incident of General uh, Roosevelt taking prisoners. And uh, after that, there was not much happening there. Another incident that did happen, though, every day I was going to what we call an OP, an observation point, the highest point on that range that I could get to, uh, to observe up and down the range with my instruments to see and glasses to see what was happening. On the way up, every morning, a tank would fire at me and my Jeep and my driver. As we left an area behind one little mountain and drove across a saddle in the mountain to another little mountain where we get, could get behind when we climbed up to where we were looking. And he'd fire us. Well, by the time his round got there, we'd be behind the other hill. So that afternoon, we'd go back and he'd fire us again. And this went on for a couple of days. So I told us the, the third day, I told Frank, my uh, driver, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm going to walk over the, through that saddle and get up there somewhere where I can see that plane with a BC scope and see if I can't locate that bird. And I want you to drive back and forth <laughs> across here a couple of times and let him shoot at you. Well, Frank didn't take too kindly that idea, <laughs> but he decided to do it. So as soon as I got settled, I waved to him, and he drove across, and the guy shot at him. And I didn't pick it up. So I waved to him to go back across. He went back across. The guy shot at him again. <laughs> this was a 90 millimeter now the, the gun. And uh, so it, he didn't hit him again. So this time I spotted the flash, and I zeroed in on it. And then told Frank to come on, to wait a little bit, and then come on back. Well, he did, and he shot at him again when he came back across. The guy was very, very vigilant about seeing, making sure that he was shooting at anything he could find on that plane. And we were the only thing moving. Well, I, was, I had him tagged. Anyway, he was dug into a, a hill. <clears throat> Apparently, he just dug a tunnel and put the tank in the tunnel and was shooting out of that. But I had him cold turkey. So we worked out the coordinates of where he was with the maps we had, which were very poor. But we worked it out pretty close. And uh, I called in the fire control and told him I had a dug-in tank and I needed to root him out and for them to uh, fire one, uh, one gun, a, uh, the number one gun of A battery of the 7th Field Artillery, and I would uh, register it. So we did. We've got a couple of overs and a couple of shorts and got a little closer. And he, I'm sure the guy knew what was happening because we, when you get overs and shorts, you know that the next one's going to be in the middle. Well, 
when it got ready to fire for effect, which would have been telling the guns to open fire on, that, on the middle range, I told the fire control officer, I said, uh, we're ready to fire for effect. Fire any time you wish. He's dug in there. And it's not, he's not going anywhere. So uh, a long time happened. I guess it was probably a half hour. And no, nothing was happening. So I called back and I said, what's going on? They said, just wait, just wait. And I said, well, I'll wait. And about an hour later, he, I got the phone rang. We have ground phones. And his uh, little phone rang. And uh, he says, uh, firing for effect. Well, I heard what sounded like thunder back behind us there. I never heard so many guns go off at one time in my life. And I heard all of this artillery, these artillery shells going over us. And they landed on that little hill where that tank was located. I think, I may be mistaken, but I think he fired the entire division artillery. That would have been 12 105s, uh, been 12, let's see, it have been, uh, would have been more than that. It would have been three battalions of artillery, 105 artillery, been one battalion of 155 artillery, and probably a battalion of what we call long toms. These are long range, uh, high velocity 155s, and it could have been 240s, which is much larger. Anyway, whatever it was, that hill ceased to exist when the dust settled. There was no hill there, there was no tank there, there was no nothing there. It was desert, like everything else. So I presume that that tank was uh, blown to bits. Whatever the case, we had no more problem with it. We left Ocelsia Valley in the early evening, headed north again. This time, I knew that there was a battle raging in Kasserine Pass. I didn't know what it was all about. We, we were just hearing little sporadic news releases about it. Some of the reporters, Ernie Powell, and some of those people were with us, and they had, they'd call in a story and they'd get news back. And we knew that this battle was going on, raging up there, that, they, that uh, uh, this time Rommel was, had decided that he was going to go through that gorge and get back on the east side of the, on the west side of the mountain and get to the 8th Army, which would have been behind us and we would have either had to retreat or give up or fight, which we would have done. But anyway, uh, after that was all done, when we got there, it was on the 22nd, Washington's birthday. <clears throat> I went into position in the middle of the pass. Well, I didn't find out till daylight that I was a half a mile farther in the pass than I was supposed to be. Colonel Gibbs had misread his map, given us the wrong coordinates. When we got there, daylight came, and we were under intense rifle fire from the German infantry. I mean, we were duck soup. We were sitting there, and they were shooting directly at us, and our people were dropping. And uh, so we had to do something. So I started firing. We started. We set up our troops as infantry at first. We started shooting back. In the meantime, the 16th Infantry, who at that time was behind us, came forward, filtered, filtered through us, and relieved us of a lot of that fire because they they went on in. Well, the tank troops were the tanks were coming up through the valley, uh, headed for the pass. And I spotted them and started shooting them. And I'd pick off the first one and then the second one and then the third one. And it was direct fire. This was not registered fire. This was direct fire. I looked through the tube of uh, one of them that got pretty close. And I ran the, ran the tube down, looked through the tube and aimed through the tube and stuck around in there and knocked him off. That's the sort of thing we were doing. And uh, in the meantime, 
uh, I was told to get out of there as soon as I could, and uh, so we did. We uh, got four guys, went up and got some trucks, came down through that hostile fire, and you could see the bullets going through the canvas on the back of the trucks. And uh, they uh, uh, drove in there, and we hooked up those guns and took them out. Now, we were prepared to ditch the guns if necessary because we could take the firing mechanism out of the breach and they couldn't have used them because we would have taken it with us and uh, probably thrown it away or buried it somewhere. But we didn't have to do that. We, uh, we left and, and I drug them out of there and then got them into position to where they should be and then we went back to firing and we fired all day long and we fired up most of the ammunition that we had. We had another ammo train coming. And uh, so we uh, uh, worked there all day. Well, I didn't learn until later that my actions, apparently in the eyes of somebody, thought that I had done something that was worthwhile because they awarded me a silver star uh, for gallantry in action, and that's it hanging on the wall behind me along with my Purple Heart. Uh, I never did think anything about it. I don't know what I did or what we did other than the fact that we, we knew that we were in a war and we were, we were trying our best to defeat the enemy and they were trying their best to defeat us. And they did what they did best and we did what we did best and that's it. A war to a soldier is only what he can see in the front, on the sides, and sometimes in the rear. But it's not the whole picture. It's just what he's, his part of the war is 100 yards to the front, 100 yards to each side, and that's it. So that's pretty much what it was to me. I don't know uh, of anything that is significant that I did, but somebody thought so because there are several officers that signed the citation, I understand, and I only saw the one that, that came from the commanding general. After some more, uh, a little more sporadic fighting, uh, the, on May the 13th, we fought up until May the 13th when the German army capitulated and we had Africa to ourselves. Go to, uh, in, on an invasion, again, we didn't know where. We practiced. Uh, we had most air superiority. Uh, the Germans would come over occasionally and strafe and bomb a little and then hightail it back to wherever they came from. But we, uh, most of ours was, uh, was pretty openly train, uh, open training. And then we boarded uh, vessels and headed out to sea. We knew we were going on an invasion. So when we reached the shores of where we were going, we found out then that we were in Sicily. And uh, when we went ashore in Sicily, uh, the British Eighth Army was also there. And uh, we were really sort of, uh, they, they were more seasoned troops than we were. And uh, they had, uh, uh, they probably had an edge on us. But anyway, we jointly went through that island in 30 days and finished it off. Uh, after that, I was uh, told that I was going to be sent home along with uh, other, several other medal winners, and uh, we were going to come back as training officers for troops to come to Europe to, to fight and to go to the Pacific. So we did. Uh, we got back. I went across the Sahara Desert on a two-car train that had to stop occasionally to shovel the sand off the tracks so we could continue. We went all the way across that desert, 135 degrees heat, it took us about three days, and we got to Casablanca. At that point, we, drove, we loaded on the HMS Louis Pasteur, a French liner that had formerly traveled up the coast or something. It was a pretty nice little ship, it was very fast. And we went across the ocean, uh, zigzagging again, on our own, we didn't have any escort. And uh, we uh, landed in New York. When we got to New York, the commandant uh, told us that because we had come from a foreign shore, that there was a possibility that we had some type of uh, disease, and therefore they were going to quarantine us for three days. 
and we didn't take too kindly to that. And he hadn't been gone an hour when the blankets were over there. He had, we were in a fenced in compound. The, the blankets were on the fence and the troops were climbing over the fence and on their way down to the street below and thumbing a ride into New York City. When the New Yorkers found out that we had just come from overseas and in battle, <clears throat> I don't think anybody paid for a drink that night or food or anything else. It was a glorious night of celebration. The next morning, though, we were all back in camp, and they decided to lift the quarantine because it didn't do any good anyway, and uh, we were to be sent on our way. I shipped out uh, home for a, a short furlough, and then was gone down to uh, uh, to Louisiana, to Camp Livingston, Louisiana, to join a training division as an assistant G3. Uh, an assistant G3 is sort of like an assistant district attorney. You don't do too much unless you're told what to do. So I, uh, uh, at that point, I didn't exactly know what I was going to do but they took me up to a training camp about 20 miles away from the main camp and at that point I knew pretty well what was going to happen because we had ranges there, different range types of ranges for different types of training and they'd bring troops in and we'd run them through these training courses and uh, until they became pretty proficient at what they were doing and then we'd send them back and this went on until the end of the war and when the war ended of course, it was uh, uh, time to make a decision whether to get out or not. Uh, I was offered an opportunity to become a regular Army officer, and I declined because I, because I wanted to get out of the service. I had met my future wife uh, in Alexandria and had decided that I wanted to get married and settle down. And next month, we will have been married 60 years. I hope everybody can have a happy marriage like that after serving in a war. A war is a horrendous thing. It's not something to be proud of. It's not something that you want to uh, shout about nor crow about. It's something that I hope never happens to a young person in the world again, but I know it will, and I know they'll be ready just like we were. Thank you, and that's